Good morning and welcome to St. Bryce Kirk. Welcome if you are up here in the church. Welcome if you are down in the, in the cafe or in the big hall. And welcome if you are joining us online, either today or later in the week. It is good that we can worship all together the God who is always with us. Don't answer this, but take a moment to think. If the beautiful autumn weather we've been having lately has spoken to you, I wonder what it is that makes it special. Is it the leaves falling from the trees? Is it kicking through the leaves on the ground? Or is it the palette of colours? Growing up in Orkney, we moved from summer straight into winter. And I think that's because we didn't have any trees. We didn't have that palette of colours, that coppery oranges and those fiery reds. Each tree a burning bush, ablaze with God's presence. And God's presence makes itself known to us in so many ways. And our first hymn speaks of that. If you are in the church building, in the church, the cafe or the hall, please don't sing. But let's all of us focus on the words of Lord, you sometimes speak in wonders. Together, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. In the sunlight, glinting through the golden leaves. In the sound of the geese flying overhead. In the smile of a neighbor. In the care of a friend. in the questions of a child or the joy of being alive. Lord, you speak to us in so many ways. Grant us open eyes to see your wonders and open ears to hear your voice in the encounters we have with each other in the world around us 
and in those unexpected moments when we're caught up short and we glimpse your presence. May we have open minds to hear what your voice may be saying to us today. Do not worry, I am with you. I am there when life is frustrating and the world is scary. You are not alone. You can do this. You can be all that I see you to be. I am rejoicing with you. I am weeping with you. Lord, may we take your words, whatever they may be to each one of us, to heart, so that they may strengthen us, equip us, calm us, empower us, release us. We thank you for the many ways you speak to us and for the myriad of ways we glimpse your presence around, among, and within us. Teach us to appreciate these moments as we follow the example of Jesus who showed us how to wonder, how to listen, how to live, and how to love. Amen. from Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. God gives Moses miraculous powers. Then Moses answered the Lord, But suppose the Israelites do not believe me, and they're not listening to what I say. What shall I do if they say that you did not appear to me? The Lord asked him, what are you holding? A stick, he answered. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. When Moses threw it down, it turned into a snake, and he ran away from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, bend down and pick it up by the tail. So Moses knelt down and caught it and it became a stick again. The Lord said, Do this to prove to the Israelites that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. The Lord spoke to Moses again. Put your hand inside your robe. Moses obeyed. And when he took his hand out, it was diseased, covered with white spots like snow. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your robe again. He did so, and when he took it out this time, it was healthy, just like the rest of his body. The Lord said, if they will not believe you, or be convinced by the first miracle, then this one will convince them. If in spite of these two miracles they still not believe me, and if they refuse to listen to what they say, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. The water will turn into blood. 
But Morty said, No, Lord, don't send me. I've never been a good speaker, and I haven't become one since you began. I am a poor speaker, slow and hesitant. The Lord said to him, Who gives man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or dumb? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? It is I, the Lord, my bow. I will help you to speak, and I will tell you what to say. But Moses answered, No, Lord, please send someone else. At this, the Lord became angry with Moses and said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levites? I know he can speak well. In fact, he is now coming to meet you and will be glad to see you. You can speak to him and tell him what to say. I will help both of you to speak and I will tell you both what to do. He will be your spokesman and speak to the people for you. Then you will be like God telling him what to say. Take the stick with you, for with it you will perform miracles. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. Who is the greatest? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called the child, made him stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. My thanks to Martha uh, and to Trudy for her welcome. And welcome. Uh, it's such a delight to have warm living bodies together in church. Uh, Colleagues say, and it is true, that I am used to seeing some kind of visual response, which of course is now well hidden. Uh, so uh, if, if you feel that you are kind of wanting to uh, respond in any way, then just nod would be nice, just because just sometimes the, the eyes are hard to, to discern. Uh, but there is friendship amongst us, uh, even despite the limitations of our communication. We are again privileged to have duty team who are downstairs and also some people who've been in the coffee bar. And as I said last week, if you've been quite a few times to church, it's quite nice if you hang back and let others come in. And that's happened this morning and some have chosen to wait down at stairs and indeed to remain downstairs uh, for that very reason. So uh, thank you to them also. The next hymn is something which is really quite an old hymn, I guess. Uh, and I selected it many years ago for what we then called the Yellow Book. Uh, but it's a thoughtful piece, it's a reverent piece, and I think it still works, even in the language. Well, so many hymns, the language is very traditional, but uh, this one is no exception. But it's one for opening our eyes and our hearts, a sense of being receptive to God and to the space and the place and the season that we're in. Open my eyes. <laughs>
A teacher followed at a distance. A fire had been lit in the center of the courtyard and Peter joined those sitting around it. When one of the servant women saw him sitting there at the fire, she looked straight at him and said, This man too was with Jesus. But Peter denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. After a little while, a man noticed Peter and said, You are one of them too. But Peter answered, Man, I am not. And about an hour later, another man insisted strongly, There isn't any doubt that this man was with Jesus, because he is also a Galilean. But Peter answered, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. At once, while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. The Lord turned round and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered that the Lord had said to him before the cock crows tonight, you will say three times that you do not know me. Peter went and wept bitterly. Amen. And may the Lord bless the readings from his holy word. In 2006, uh, a fairly large group of Scots went to Charlotte, South Carolina for a conference for a few days. It was largely funded by the churches in Charlotte, uh, and we were ministers, church leaders of various kinds. Several came from this congregation, and we had days of teaching, lectures, visits, all kinds of things. It was a terrific visit, beautiful town, and lovely hospitality. In one of the groups uh, in the morning, I remember ministers, are, were, uh, must have been about eight or nine of us in a particular group, uh, and the leader of the group said, uh, mixed in with American leaders, ministers, church leaders of various kinds, so that was great fun as well. Uh, and I, I've told this story, I think, before, but uh, it's pertinent, because the opening for the discussion was, from an American to what they were used to as an American audience said, Tell people in your group something that you're great at. Well, yes, that was the response. <laughs> and there was a, so, of course, one or two Americans chipped in. Well, I'm really great at this, and I'm great at that, and I'm great at the next thing. And then there was a kind of silence from one section of the group. And then a voice piped up after an awkward long pause. Um. You have to understand, we're from Scotland, and we, we don't say that kind of thing. <laughs> it, it, it kind of goes against us. We, even if it's something we are good at, we're not going to come out and say, I'm great at it. It just doesn't feel right. And of course, the Americans looked at us as if we'd just dropped in from Mars. And they weren't being big-headed. It was just, this just recognizing uh, a kind of I am what I am kind of phrase, uh, and I'm good at this. Uh, we, we don't find that easy, do we? Even if we are really good at something, uh, the notion of saying it. In actual fact, being brought up to think that somebody might be big-headed might be the worst thing of all. You, that, that, you know, it, so, oh, they're really good, but don't tell them. I mean, that used to be the culture. Uh, and, and I remember a story of a professor of mine when he was a minister in Buchan, leading over a garden, uh, a field gate, watching a farmer. And this, his, he was watching his son plowing a field. And the minister, this lecturer, said to the farmer, "Ah, your boy's doing really well. That's a good line he's got. You know, he's a good. He's good with the plowing." I said, "The farmer, I but didn't I tell him anything rather than help him be big. That's just kind of." 
So somebody that's kind of self-deprecating and, and kind of holding back and looking towards their own faults and idiosyncrasies, we kind of warm to that. I think Moses was the original Scotsman, you know, who said, oh, don't ask me, I can't. I'm not up to the job. Kind of fits in with our... Now, there's not to say, don't misunderstand. Of course, we know that there are plenty of Scots who are big-headed and full of themselves. We, we know that. Uh, and some are just as likely to crow as anybody else. But culturally, across the board, we tend to think, oh, maybe not. We don't do that kind of thing. So we joined the story of, of Moses, uh, I, uh, mentioning it last Sunday as well. Uh, and I, we, we've heard about the story of Moses saying that he's not a very good speaker. And you probably will know that bit of the story. We're going back to probably 1500 BC. We're going back to ancient Egypt. But the stories were written up centuries later. Remember, when you're reading the Old Testament, you're not reading stories that were written down at the time. You know, history is written by the victors and also by the prevailing culture. So from about 500 years after the events, right through to just a century or two before Jesus, these stories are being edited and represented. And so they're often, they often put in things that will be favorable to the audience of their day, as opposed to might have been right there in the original story, just pulling out emphases that suit them. And so, uh, 1500 BC, uh, and we've got, we don't even, to give you an illustration of that, uh, nobody will forget the name of Adolf Hitler, because he was the great enemy. And you're not going to write up a, a history of Europe, even centuries later, and forget who the leader of Germany was under the Third Reich. You're not going to forget who the, the leader was when, you know, who was the king that was defeated at Bannockburn? Scots will tell you, even though, when they know nothing about history. You know, who was, who was the butcher? Who was the butcher Cumberland? Well, of course you remember him because he's part of the story of, of, of Culloden. When, it's, when you've got an arch enemy who's done horrible things to your people, you don't forget. But the Pharaoh in the Moses story is never named. The Pharaoh just means the king. There were loads of Pharaohs, and we've got a, we can guess who it might have been. But why? Because the story was written up centuries later, and it was written up to reflect the issues of the day at the time when it was written up. And of course, we've got these interactions and these dialogues centuries later, before things were written or recorded. They couldn't possibly know every word that everybody said, particularly when it's an inner dialogue, supposedly with God in direct voice speaking to an individual. So this is symbolic. It is a reconstruction. It is a, it is a, a gloriously meaningful legend and myth. It's part of the Eastern storyteller's art to bring out meaning and purpose and color. And all the stories of Egyptian magic there are just part of that uh, illustration to, to embroider the story and to have dramatic impact. We do, not, we do not and should not take them literally. But it's part of the culture and the text of the time. So let's enjoy it and enter into it. And we have Moses. Moses, the very name, is Egyptian. Tut Moses is one of the pharaohs. We've got Ram, Mar we know him as Ramesses, but there's Ramesses, is Moses at the end of Ram, Ramesses. It's an Egyptian name. We know that he was probably, well, very certainly brought up in an Egyptian court in some kind of strange uh, exchange of, of children being taken in. There are parallels in other cultures to that baby thing and being drawn out of the water. So this is a legend and a myth, and yet it's also historical. And Moses, we then have, he's called to take his people out, the burning bush, and go back and recall his people from slavery. We're not told that Moses was the only person who had that idea. I mean, it's unlikely that the, the people of Israel were content in their slavery. We know that in slave groups, even in the American South, and we've heard a lot about that recently, there were slave rebellions, there were slave leaders, there was an underground culture of communication, uh, there were all kinds of things going on that the white slave owners knew nothing about, uh, and there were es slaves that escaped. So let's not imagine that the idea hadn't entered anybody else's head, but the story is focused on Moses. And maybe in religious terms, maybe God had called several people all trying to get his people out. We just don't know. But this is a Moses story because Moses was part of the tradition and history of Israel. And I love the dialogue. First of all, he blames the people. Nobody will believe me, he says. So he blames the fact that folk won't follow him. They're not going to trust him. Why would they? He's a foreigner. He's an expat. 
you know, he's, he's, he's had a cushy life. He's come back from Pharaoh. Who's he to telling, telling us what to do? But uh, he still feels the compassion for his people and a sense of suffering. Years, years, a generation later, he's a generation away in Midian uh, as, as a shepherd looking after his father-in-law's sheep. But then he does go back. And then there's that exchange of symbols that were current at the time with a stick in the hand and so forth. Uh, but again, symbolic. But then we get to the bit where, again, Moses says, no, don't send me. I, I'm slow and hesitant in speech. And I love this phrase. And I've not become a better speaker since you've, or, or since you've been speaking to me. I think that's a great line. You know, that's smart. I mean, that very repost questions the truth of the statement. I am slow and hesitant in speech. I don't think so. And there's no evidence, no shred of evidence in all of the biblical stories about Exodus that Moses was slow and hesitant in speech. So is this just an excuse? Well, yes, it is an excuse. I, I'm, we kind of quite like that. There's a, there's a history of leadership in, in Scripture of, of reluctant people being called to serve. The, you know, reluctant uh, Peter, we heard, deny Jesus. He, he skulks off into the night. He's, he's a failure. He is described as, oh, ye of little faith. Uh, he he's, has to be restored and reclaimed and made good, focusing that the power of his leadership comes from God and not through his own human frailties, although he had greatness as well. Many great leaders in Scripture started off by running away. We know Jonah took off in a ship, and look what happened to him in that particular parable. We know Elijah went off to a cave when he was running away from King Ahab and the wicked Queen Jezebel. I love that name. You don't get many girls christened Jezebel, do you? It all goes, all goes back to that story. Uh, there's many examples of people running. Isaiah said, I am, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. He didn't feel called. He didn't feel he could. He wasn't up to it. There is that feeling that the greatness lies in knowing that you're not great and knowing that you need God's help, the spirit within you, some guidance, something bigger than yourself to redeem and make good your own weaknesses and failings. That's not a bad approach to leadership. A real self-awareness, not full of your own importance, but aware that you have gifts, but you've also got weaknesses. We're good at some things, but not necessarily good at everything. So let's build on the strengths. And again, uh, you know, in the dialogue, this beautiful little drama the, the storyteller works up, uh, there's a bit about you know, God made the mouth and so forth, but then he eventually he implores, please don't send me. <laughs> God get angry. That's the story. God gets angry. Oh, come on. You know, buck up. You can do this. Is kind of what we might think in the story, this figure of God uh, would be saying. Well, it might not have been humility or even honesty. It might have been something else entirely. In 1482, there was a meeting of the Scottish nobles, and they were very, very disenchanted with James III and one of his particular regents. And they decided that he ought to be put to death. They thought it would be good if we could dispose of him. So they met together, and a, 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 a man called Archibald Douglas, the fifth Earl of Angus. You remember Archie, you've heard of him. Uh, Ura, Ura Archie. Archibald Douglas, the fifth Earl of Angus, uh, decided that uh, he, sh he should do it. And they thought, well, then Lord Grey, in this gathering of Scottish nobles, said, Aye, well, what are Bell the Cat? which in English means, who would dare to bell the cat? Belling the cat goes back to an ancient Greek myth. Do you know the phrase? You can nod if you do or shake if you don't. To bell the cat comes, some of them are enclosed, uh, in, in, included in Aesop's, editions of Aesop's fables. To bell the cat goes back to a story in Greek from Greek mythology, that there was a group of mice who met together because they were worried and concerned that their lives were being terrorized by a cat. And so in this council, somebody came up in the council with, the, with one of the mice came up with a suggestion that it would be great if we just had a bell round the neck of the cat and then all the mice would hear the cat coming and they could run away. 
Thought, that's a good idea. And then somebody asked, oh, who's going to put the bell on the cat? So to bell the cat, I, I'm, I would like to rescue that phrase and expression. Uh, it, it, it means that somebody's got to do the really most difficult job and face up to the danger. You've got the image. So when Lord Grey said of Archibald Douglas, the fifth Earl of Angus in 1482, what or bell the cat, you'll now know what he meant. And then on, from then on, apparently, Archie was known as Archie Bell the Cat. Look it up. Moses was being asked to bell the cat. And of course, we have a kind of similar kind of role every time the House of Commons, and for those unfamiliar with British parliamentary procedure, we have some arcane traditions. Uh, and one of them is that when the Speaker of the House of Commons is appointed, it is traditional that he or she resists and struggles against it and is forcibly put into the chair in order to be the Speaker. We know the Speaker as the one who conducts the business, but why call Speaker? And why this traditional reluctance? Sometimes you wish they were more reluctant and didn't actually get there. Well, it was because when in the other days of Parliament, the Speaker at the Commons was often at loggerheads with the monarch, and it was the Speaker's job to go and relay the decisions of the Commons to the monarch. This is what we have decided, Your Majesty. Off with his head! So the speaker, if it was saying something unpleasant to the monarch, might well, literally, be his last words. Your life was in your hands when you were the speaker because you had to speak the view and the decisions of the commons to the monarch. Hence the reluctance to take on the position. Moses? Well, he was being asked to be the speaker for the house of God, for the people of God, the speaker for the will of God. And... He might well have lost his head. Nobody knew what would happen when he went to the Pharaoh's court. So maybe he was just acting in self-preservation. Maybe that was a convenient excuse. It's kind of easier when you're being asked to take something on. It's easier to say, I'm not up to it, than to actually say, I don't want to do it. It's more presentable to, to be apparently humble and to be vulnerable and to just, you know, and, and it might well be some truth in that. But on the other hand, it also gets your excuses in early. It means if it doesn't work, things go wrong, and you don't achieve what your mission is, then quite clearly, well, I told you. I told you. You shouldn't have asked. I did it against my will. You've got your excuse in early. Good we ploy. And we've, we've all got our favorite kind of usual excuses for things that we just want to avoid. You know, I'm too busy, or I'm not very well, or... And Jesus has a parable about people who make excuses. The parable of the great wedding feast when the king sends out, and or the, 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 whoever he is sends out uh, invitations to all and sundry, and it's a great honor to be asked, but it's a bit of a blow to ego to be, have your guests refuse. That's breaking all the social protocols. Oh, no, I've just got a new field. I've got to go and look after it, says one. Ah, oh, no, I've just got five yoke of, yoke of oxen. I need to get them trained, says another. I'm just married, says the third one, so I can't come. Full of excuses. And, of course, in the parable, then the, the king sends out to the lanes and highways and byways and brings in all and sundry and says, you're welcome. These people who think there's something in my kingdom won't come, so you come. A parable about the universal nature of God reaching beyond those who thought they were privileged and included. That was a parable against Jewish exclusivism and reaching out to those beyond that. So the idea of excuses, yeah, we live with it all the time. So Moses, maybe, maybe he did have an issue with his speech, but that was a smart answer. You know, I have not become a good speaker since you started asking me. <laughs> I love that. But maybe he was leaning into it. You know, we can have a weakness, we can have a hesitation, and we can either lean into it and make the most of it and just say, All right, count me out. Or we can lean away from it and actually say, well, I know what, this might be, I'm not, I've got, to, I've got this to cope with, but I'll give it a try. And maybe if you help me, 
And sometimes people will take on something if they're asked to do it with somebody. This is an example of teamwork because we have Aaron or Aaron, however we wish to pronounce it, is the brother of Moses. Now, he's three years older than Moses. He's the big brother. He should be the one that's getting the top job. It goes against all the cultural norms that the younger brother gets the key role. And clearly, there's some kind of issue going on here because centuries later, there was a priesthood all known as the sons of Aaron. That was the name for the priesthood in Israel, the sons of Aaron. So this is going back to give authority and authorization and tradition and and, and position to the people who became a caste of priests. You didn't have it as a calling. You were a priest because your father was a priest and your grandfather was a priest and your, your sons would be priests. It was a priestly family thing. And they weren't full-time. They did, they did spells weeks or months every so often and then they went back to their ordinary lives and then they became priests again for set periods. And maybe people were thinking, who are these people? Why do they have all the privileges? And centuries later, where we have a story where Aaron is brought in, given position, side by side with his brother. Here is the important man. He's the one who's going to speak. He's the one who will deliver. You don't, might not know much about Aaron, but you know some of the things he said. Most of you could quote words of Aaron. Did you know that? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Number six, the words of Aaron, the priest, for the people, for a blessing, for the whole nation. We sing them at baptisms, at ordinations, and on other occasions, and we sing them set to music. Aaron, the brother of Moses, we sing his words. Although, curiously, the text says that Moses told Aaron what to say. (laughs) Even then, he didn't get the top job. And the one time Aaron had Moses out of his hair and he got a wee bit of freedom because Moses had gone hill climbing, Aaron cocks up because that was the story of the golden calf when they got all the jewelry and smelted it down and they made a symbol of what was seen as pagan idolatry. So left to his own devices, Aaron got it wrong. And when Moses came back, his wee brother was furious with him. So the excuse, well, we've all got maybe things that we can, we're called upon to speak to. Maybe there's, maybe there's, uh, maybe there's a culture in an office where there's uh, somebody's being picked on, but nobody wants to confront the boss with it. Maybe, maybe there's a politician that's acting inappropriately towards female staff, and somebody needs to tell them. Maybe there's some kind of family business where one member of the family is given all the control and a bit more money and there's inequality, well, there's a favorite there. Somebody, somebody has to tell the old man that he's not behaving fairly to his other children. Maybe there's just issues where there's some kind of issue with monarchy. We have to speak to the monarch. We have to find courage. And we have to be carefully editing at our excuses. It might be everybody can find a reason for not doing something. That's not difficult. But finding help with the task in hand, finding some kind of sharing, or finding a sense of dependence on what God can do with us is biblical, is essential. And maybe that's how things change. And so Moses polished up his very rusty Egyptian, having not used it for a generation and went back and confronted the Pharaoh. And the rest, as they say, is history. What's your excuse? Once again, in the 
Okay, once again, in the part of the church service that we would normally have an offering, uh, I've been asking Bill to play. He has done that uh, beautifully for us. Just a moment of thought uh, and meditation on whatever you've just heard or whatever you've been thinking. Uh, and a reminder that there is a bowl at the door if you haven't or would like to make uh, your donation and offering for the church. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. You pause in prayer. Do you remember being asked and you said no? Do you remember the reason you gave? Was it the whole truth? Was it in any way the truth? Did you regret it? Did you change your mind? Do you remember seeing something you felt you needed to do to address an issue, to help another, to be involved in a group, thinking you could, I just, I could do that, but bottling out.
Lord, teach us to have a real awareness of who we are. That we can say, I am what I am. With faults and weaknesses, failings and regrets. But with gifts and talents and potential. Beyond our imagining, especially with others. Especially with a sense of God's spirit and power especially in the healing love of Christ our Lord. There is a time ahead for each of us. There is a time ahead for the church. When people will need to listen to the voice of God and the story of Moses. For we need to serve God's people in a time of negativity and bondage. Lord, hear our prayers for those we have let down, sometimes by what we have done, more often by what we've failed to do. Hear prayers for those who are tormented by a sense of guilt or failure because of past refusals, that we might allow ourselves to be ourselves and know that you still love us, as do those in our lives who we also may have let down, but who continued unquenchably to love us. And may we be given the openness of heart to love others who may have let us down. That we might understand how and why. And that there is always the potential for healing and renewal and returning strength. Take the offerings that we have given and that we do give week by week in whatever shape or form. We ask, Lord, that it might be used in the strengthening of your church, in the service to your world, in the proclamation of love in Christ and love in our community. And we ask your strength and blessing for those we know who suffer, who are anxious this day, those who look to the past and those who try to avoid the past. Hear these are prayers. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We used to have church intimations. Do you remember those things? Often at the very beginning of the service. Sometimes it was the most interesting bit of the service. I've got two kind of intimations. We scheduled to have a communion Sunday, uh, two weeks today, first Sunday of November. The worship team uh, have uh, decided that we are going to do that. So it will be a communion service, but we can't serve it in any of the usual ways. So there won't be trays going around and stuff. Uh, but we are going to do it. We will have uh, little cups of wine and a little piece of bread laid out at set spots around the congregation so that you'll go and sit beside it and not knock it over. And then we'll uh, be able to have communion uh, individually. And there'll be something up downstairs for those downstairs. Uh, so you can come and it will be communion. But the message is if you can't come or you decide not to come, you can have communion at home. And I was made um, aware of how important that was the last time I did a kind of informal communion online, just myself. Um, and was on the camera taking the pictures. But I was really surprised and impressed that so many people found that so meaningful to do that at home. So for those of you who might be listening at home or those of you here who might choose to be at home, then please, you can do that at home. Just get your little table, or whatever way you want to set it out to be sacramental, to have your little glass, your piece of bread, or whatever would substitute for those. Uh, incidentally, the wine will all be non-alcoholic. It keeps it simpler. 
uh, uh, but we can have that as a communion service. So uh, be prepared if you want to have it at home. And uh, if you want to come, obviously, you can have it here. That's communion, two weeks' time. After that, it's Remembrance Sunday, and we have usually changed the chairs and looked at the War Memorial window. It's always been quite a significant change. We can't do that this time. So Remembrance will just be facing in this direction, as usual, with all the seats as they are. Beyond that uh, is, is scheduled to be my last Sunday uh, here. There's going to be a problem with that because I've got a feeling more than 31 people might want to come. And it's going to be really difficult just to find those uh, who, who would either arrive ridiculously early or be chosen in some way. I am responsible to the end of the month. All right, I've never been responsible. I'll rephrase that. I am uh, responsible for conducting services to the end of the month. I was going to have two Sundays off. I've changed that plan. And again, with discussion, both with session and with the worship team. The plan now is I will have effectively three last Sundays. But you'll have to book. So if you want to be in the church, you will have to phone and decide which of the three Sundays. They will effectively be a, a very much the same service. I'm not very good at doing things identically one time after another, but uh, it will effectively be the same service uh, over three weeks. So we can have 20 folk in the big hall and downs. We could in total have uh, about 70 folk, but only 31 upstairs. Uh, but at least over three weeks, that would be about a, nearly 100 folk who could be here for what will effectively be the final service. Uh, uh, clearly, the three spread out is a hope, because obviously uh, the other alternative I had thought was to have the 15th totally online and have nobody here. But I was shouted down, got boos from, from various people that, that I should not do that. <laughs> so... Uh, the phone number that you will be required to, to phone will be given to you shortly. It is actually Anne Hunter, our session clerk, has volunteered. I put that, Moses listening here, uh, has volunteered. My phone doesn't work. That would have been a good one, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm changing my number. Uh, we could, we could, well, she didn't do any of that. She just said yes. Uh, so you can phone Anne's number, which will be given to you shortly. Uh, and you will then book which Sunday you would like to come. You will only be allowed to come for one of those three weeks. All right? So uh, no false names given, please. Uh, we'll find you out. Uh, and basically, uh, that's how it's going to be done. So effectively, three last Sundays. I can't think of any better way to do that. I'm sorry. But um, that'll be it. And then finally, you'll get rid of me. I, the Lord of sea and sky, great modern hymn.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen. Can I remind you that if you need to use the lift or the main stair for whatever reason, then you can do that. But otherwise, could you use the corner stairs to exit by? Uh, and obviously, any further uh, mingling together in the church is, is not um, allowed. But clearly, uh, what you do outside is entirely up to you. But many thanks for coming.